uh, Node Security Live, right? Uh, it might also be called uh, Node Selfies Live. So if you're not into security and selfies, you might enjoy the talk on over in one of the other rooms. Because uh, it's the end of the day, and we're we're gonna get a little bit a little bit ridiculous in here. I want uh, I want people to wake up, right? We just had break. We just had cookies. Um, I don't really do this normally. I don't really get uh, ridiculous. I talk about security, so I talk about serious things, and I'm stern faced, and shake my fist, and talk about security. That's what I do. So I thought that I would try to be a little bit uh, ridiculous. So, with that said. Uh, first of all, I want to say thank you to um, my slides being cut off. Uh, thank you to the Thunderplane staff, Amanda and Jesse, who are the most amazingly uh, amazing people. Um, their energy and uh, hospitality is just—it's—it's uh, uh, it's catchy. It's just like it's—it's it's viral. It's amazing to be around them. All of the staff that's made this possible, the volunteers, uh, everyone. This has been uh, an amazing event. So now that that's out of the way. I am Adam, uh, Adam Baldwin. I am not the actor Adam Baldwin. I did not star in Firefly. Um, I don't want to talk to you about Chuck uh, or anything like that. So I am the CSO at And Yet, uh, where we make communication, collaboration uh, stuff. We do a lot of uh, things with uh, what WebRTC and Node, and we, we build cool software there. Uh, I'm also part of the Lyft team. Uh, it is not Uplift, Carrot Lyft, Powered by Lyft, if you thought it was that. Sorry, we pronounced the uh, and, and and yet, but not in that. That was a giant mistake. Uh, it just happened. So uh, we pen test software. So we, we get to break uh, all of the cool stuff that uh, you wonderful developers build. That's, that's my job, pointing out flaws in what other people do, uh, and try to do that in the nicest way possible. Uh, and uh, we get to do really cool things for uh, really cool companies like GitHub and NPM and Panic, uh, just some of our clients that, that we get to, to do testing for. And it's, it's, it's amazing. Um, it is not like the movies. Hacking is not like the movies. It's staring at the screen with the Yeah. So uh, I also founded the Node Security Project. Uh, if you got one of those cool little stickers, if you put it on your laptop, your laptop's now secure. Thank you. Um, it makes everything more secure. Just put them on everything. Uh, that is a project that we founded to basically evangelize security in the Node community. I came to the Node community uh, from the Django community. Um, and yay. And I came to Node and I was like, we, we need some support here. We need evangelism in, in the security community. And uh, I was like, where's the biggest threat to my code base? Like, I can control my developers, I control the quality of the code there. I can't control NPM. I can't control the code that you publish. So I was like, let's audit all of the modules. And this is back when there was maybe 30,000 modules in the registry, and there's now 100,000, I think, or it's getting close. Um, so we're like, hey, let's boil the ocean and audit all the modules and you know, give security guidance out and, and whatever. And turns out that's really hard. And uh, so what that really bought me, what the foray into this project of the Node Security Project was, it, it basically uh, accidentally made me the uh, chief um, security evangelist for Node. It's basically myself sort of titled, like, I just go out and talk about security in Node, and that's what I do all of the time. That's just, it's, it's, that's what I do. So there's that. We'll talk about that a little bit later. So why uh, am I uh, here? as a, a, a node, you know, talking node security live. I'm here because I like to think about security differently. There's a security conference down the hall right now where they're all talking about InfoSec stuff, some application security stuff, you know, some native stuff, some hardware stuff. They're, they're speaking in a bubble right now. <clears throat> so, my, so what I did uh, back in 2008, I quit my job at Symantec. I said, we're doing InfoSec wrong. We're doing, web, we're doing application security wrong. And I want to take it to, I want to take what we're doing in the security community, get out of our echo chamber, and bring it to developers. That's what I wanted to do. So I, so I, I quit my job. I started a consultancy. And I started, uh, I, I was really into Django at the time. So I, start, so I was like, like cool. I, I found some bugs in Django. Like I can, I can evangelize the security stuff in Django. I uh, went and spoke at DjangoCon. I started going to developer conferences. Who? I found communities, uh, both the Django community and then later the Node community, 
um, communities in which I fell in love with, like the, the people, the welcomingness, um, which is way different than the InfoSec community if you're familiar with it. Uh, normally we sit again and we sit and shake our fists and say you wrote bad code, et cetera, or whatever. And uh, we started to say, well, now it's your problem. Like here's, here's our recommendations. But we don't realize that you live within these constraints. You live within business constraints. You live with you know, all kinds of this, this, your world. We just, whatever, do it our way. And that's, that's wrong. So I like to think differently about security. I like to, I like to have opportunities to challenge my assumptions. Um, and ev evangelism often feels like this. You're climbing. You're never going to reach the top. It's a broken record, right? A lot of this stuff that I'm going to talk about today, I've talked about in other talks, and you can go watch them, and I might have said it more succinctly in there if you didn't get it in this one. Um, but this is what it often feels like. And we'll come back to this diagram because there's something else that parallels uh, this as well. <clears throat> this talk um, is an experiment for me into challenging um, this particular thing. It's always better to build in security as you go. Don't bolt it on afterwards. That's, that's, a, that's a phrase, and I even, I even heard it uh, uh, talking to somebody from uh, Route 66, right? Like, in talking about security, like, it's like, just build it in as you go. Like, it's just, it's just, there's this phrase, and sort of like, what does that mean? What, like, so I want, I want to, we'll, we'll revisit that at the end. Um, as part of the experiment, I built an app. So you should probably get your, your if you get a laptop, you should probably get it out because this will be a little interactive, it'll be a little ridiculous. Uh, if you don't want to participate, that's fine, you should anyway. Um, so I built an app called Tweet My Face. Uh, it's an app about, it's, it, it does selfies and it's a really, it's a really fun app. Uh, it's the one we're going to be using as a demo for the different vulnerabilities that I'm going to show and I'm going to show you the code for that. Um, yeah, tweetmyface.liftsecurity.io. Um, it's pretty fun. I can show you it. Should we be scared? <laughs> no, okay, so, so here's the deal. Um, yeah, normally you should, because security guy and I want to uh, you know, do mean stuff to you. There is, there's another one called vulnerable.liftsecurity.io, which has a bunch of stuff removed, which we'll play with a little later. This one has the security controls built in. Um, so you can sign in to tweet my face. Uh, I'll just sign into my, my fake account, um, which it looks like that. So um, we can just go, hi, right? Um, and then you show up there. So you show up my slide deck too. Hey, yeah. Uh, you'll also notice that there's a tweet, uh, there's a, a thing at the bottom that says like, I'm in Adam Baldwin's talk. So I'm like self-promotional because you know, security guy. Um, that changes as the slides change. So if you want to live tweet the talk, as those change, you can just make a face and hit the button. Anyway, so <laughs> it was the most ridiculous thing I could think of to build an app, a demo app, an app that had enough surface area that we could talk about sort of technical uh, things. Um, so <laughs> yes, thank you for that. This is, this is making all of my day. Okay. So let's get this stuff on the show on the road. Uh, here's the, here, the require, basically here's the architecture. Uh, there's socket IO between uh, the reveal slide deck, uh, Jack, what's a Jack? Slide deck and, um, twi uh, and the actual service out on the, the, the internets, the clouds. There's a socket IO connection between your browser and that to get the uh, tweet updates. Uh, and then there's a REST API for when you actually, um, it doesn't work on mobile, I'm sorry, uh, for anyone trying. Uh, it's Chrome only, basically. So uh, it's got a REST interface to upload the, the tweet so that I could show a few different things, uh, a few different vulnerability classes. Uh, and then it's ampersand JS on the front end. We really won't talk about the front end code, but it's just a little simple client side app. This is, this is awesome. <laughs> um, so thank you for waking up and doing something ridiculous. This is, like, this is fun. So, okay, this is getting me excited. This is all, this is the, this is the app. It's super simple. It's got a login route, a tweet route, uh, a token route for, for th some authentication stuff, a socket IO endpoint, and uh, some static resources um, there. And, you know, what, it's, it's got, uh, it's got, uh, it's got some surface area. It's got some vulnerabilities. It's, it's, it's kind of fun. Yeah, okay, see. 
So, um, so let's talk a little bit about uh, something that I feel is extremely important um, when building an application uh, as a developer. And, and I, I built this application, just rewinding a little bit, um, to have some developer empathy in my role as a security person. I don't tend to build apps end to end, right? So I wanted to build something that would be sort of in production for a period of time um, and get beat up a little bit. And uh, I, I wanted to understand sort of what those feelings were. So as I, as I went along, and I'm going to sort of talk about that if, if I can sort of remember to interject uh, those things. But the, the ultimate thing is that for, for security when you're developing apps is that uh, you have to have a, a cross section of <laughs> you have to have a cross section. Peter, uh, you have to have a cross section of um, uh, giving a damn and knowledge, and you you sort of like have this this intersection there, and uh, also there is a code of conduct. So the reason why it tweets it instead of just putting it up on the slide deck is so that you're held accountable for um, the the code of conduct, please. So um, it's a little self policing there. I, I think that, that you, you, you're responsible as a developer for what goes into production, whether you're at some giant megacorp uh, or uh, it's just your, your small startup. You are the start, you're the catalyst of changes in the code that end up in production. You're responsible for what you acquire. So you're responsible for what you create, and the organization and yourself is also responsible for what you acquire. You're requ you are responsible uh, for all the code that the people in this room write that you just sort of imported into your, your application, which is typically 80% of like, you know, any Node app. You're just like, here's a bunch of modules, and you require them, and then now they're in your code doing stuff. Do you know what they do? Have you looked? Or we just take that at face value? <laughs> what the heck is that? Um, and you're responsible to improve that knowledge. So, you, so again, you're responsible to give a damn. You're responsible to improve yourself. Uh, doing those things means that you're going to climb that, that, that staircase we were talking about. You're going to do better in terms of building an application. Um, so developers are hard to patch, hard, not impossible. That's just something that, that we. Um, if you think about every new hire in your your organization or your startup or whatever is uh, a potentially a potential set of unpatched vulnerabilities, right? If you don't know the code they're producing, if you don't have controls in place to um, to actually compensate for for the code that they're they're building, um, so things that I missed as I built this this application in in what I've been a part of in other development processes was. I didn't really follow a strict um, set of rules to stop me from doing stupid crap in my application. Uh, I missed the peer review process, right? And actually, uh, actually, after I deployed the application, I gave this to my team to say, like, I'm going to talk about security in this. Can you please review it for me? Uh, and I did that wrong. It was already in production. He's like, yeah, you hard coded some cookie values, so technically they can take those and get an admin connection if they wanted to the, your server. And I was like, OK, that's really hard because I already deployed it and I don't want to change it because I know it works. Um, so even like I made that mistake, right? It was like it was a stupid demo, but I wanted to take it from, seriously from the perspective of actually building an app. Uh, I missed that. Like I, I put in the code. I got it working. I missed it. Um, and then automated tools. I didn't honor my, uh, my, my linter, my, um, uh, and I didn't have any CI for this. I didn't have any. I didn't have any tools that, that really um, helped me um, defer security vulnerability between myself and production. Yes, selfies. So um, one thing that I can say from experience is simplicity. And now people are starting selfies of other people. This is great. <laughs> simplicity, uh, consistency and simplicity is uh, as, you, as I made the app more complex, it became more and more annoying to have to think about all the edges of my application. So simplicity is just, thank you for that. Simplicity is, um, <laughs> so this, I knew this would be distracting. Um, <laughs> consistency, I shouldn't have put it up here. Okay, so uh, as it got more complex and as I got more edges, uh, it, was hard, it was basically harder for me to keep track of mentally what I was touching and what I was affecting. Uh, and I think that's an important part to remember is that as apps get more complex, as you add complexity, uh, your likelihood of actually screwing something up goes up, 
greatly, um, which is again, if you're in Chris's talk from last, he talked about like that's what he wanted to see. He wanted to see where those basically those exception edges were with these large pull requests because uh, the old, the adage goes, there's a tweet I. I can't attribute it to the right person. I don't know who, who it was, but it was. Uh, you can have a, a pull request that's five lines or ten lines long, and it's going to have, uh, you know, five bugs in it. But you have a 500 line pull request. It's fine. Just merge it, right? Like that's that's the adage, and that's not necessarily good. So I think keeping a, a simplistic view um, of whatever you're building. That's why I like the Node community and the small composable modules. A module can do um, a small thing, and it can do it well, and you can you can see what that looks like. However, think about building a wall with a bunch of bricks. I can tell you if the bricks are solid. I can tell you if the bricks are good. But you can still put that wall together and knock it over. So just because modules in and of themselves are composed and actually perform good behavior, when you string them together, you may get something that is undesirable. So um, second thing, uh, vulns, uh, vulnerabilities happen. As a developer, uh, you need to know that's where I was saying that sort of the, the, the caring versus knowledge. You have to understand the vulnerabilities uh, and their technical impact for the environment that you're dealing with. So and you have to know how to fix them. So what I thought I would do is take the app that I built. We're going to talk about some of the controls that I put into that and uh, also talk about a bit about how, I guess I'll just say right now, how kind of annoying it was. Um, ignorance is bliss. When you don't, when you take an architecture perspective and you're trying to design a feature, and you, you let's say you've never done something before. I've never hooked up to the Twitter API and made something tweet like before with Node. So I, I had to fight with a bunch of different things that I just ended up punting on because I just I was like, I want to like I was like okay I need to do this securely so I got to add you know these tokens and all this authentication and whatever, and then I was like. Okay, I got to back off on that and make the feature work first, and then start adding this on again, which started reminding me of like, what am I, what am I really doing with that? I'm, I'm, I'm just, I'm again bolting that back on, I'm taking into consideration, but I'm, I'm, again just bolting it back on. So, uh, I've got three or four different sort of classes of things that I think in Node web apps specifically um, are sort of um, usually easy wins: security headers. Uh, who here is familiar with X-Frame options? Couple of hands. Okay. Um, there's a nice list of them. Strict transport security, all these other ones. Yay! You turn these on and you get a bunch of free cool stuff in the browser. Um, that's the easiest way to put that. And it's easy to turn on in most frameworks, even if you're just adding headers with raw HTTP, it's pretty easy. Um, so let's look at what uh, XFrame, so XFrame options header that we're going to be talking about within the, like a click jacking type attack. Uh, XFrame options basically says uh, your site can't be framed or it can be framed on the same origin, right? So if we, uh, let's see, so as an example, this is just uh, this is the best tool I've I've seen to visualize what happens during a click jacking attack and why why it's actually bad. They're they're usually called like one click attacks. Um, so let's take like vulnerable dot security dot io. We're just going to load it up in the frame here. <sighs> okay, hide overlay. Let's sign in. No, like I should have been already signed into this. Vulnerable. Let's just do it over here. Boop. Sure, whatever. Nobody cares. Um, now we can go to just the slash tweet. We can load that. We can load that up, and we'll add the we'll add the overlay, and then we add a click thing. And we're just going to follow this button. So what happens when we re replay this? In a normal attack, you'd come and you'd see some other content. You'd see a a game, or it's going to get you to do different actions, right? And it's going to have this, it's basically going to have an invisible iframe. So when we, when we replay it, that content falls along. And so it's going to let the click fall straight through. So X frame, X frame options basically says you can't frame that. And so when I, basically when I click, I'm like, like that. Hopefully that worked. Please work. Anyway. Um, now if we do, if we cancel replay um, and go back and change that, 
Tweet my face. Um, are you serious? Did I not put that in there? That's cool. I might not add it back in. That's wonderful. Um, it would normally block that from loading if you did something like Google reload. Stab is kind of hokey. Google.com, you can't frame it. It's got they've got that they've got that option set. It does not allow framing, so you don't get that content. The browser just says basically go away. Um, so it's a it's a quick and easy win in terms of um, uh, it's built it's it's built into Happy Happy Core thanks to uh, Nathan Lafreniere, uh, Quit Lahawk on Twitter. It's built into Happy. You can just set security true. Um, kind of a little misnomer because maybe there's other problems there, but yeah, security true and pass the options in, and that's it. You have security headers. You have all of those security headers that I mentioned, and they're set to same default. That's a pretty, that's a pretty significant win just right out of the box. Um, now, uh, who here has heard of content security policy? Actually, way more than I expected. This is rad. So for those who haven't, uh, content security policy is a, is a policy, uh, it's a way of defining what content and what origins are allowed to to load content and execute scripts uh, on your domain. So you can do things like, I only want to load scripts from my domain, and that way if you have content injection of some kind, which I'm not going to go into because it's covered in just about a billion other places on the web, um, if you get content injection or something, that script can't run. And so basically you're proactively blocking cross-site scripting vulnerabilities, which is really cool. Uh, it also has a reporting mode, so you can say, when I, when I see a violation, Send a, send a big, giant, ugly JSON blob to this, this endpoint so I can report on it, so I can see proactively, am I getting, um, do I have got bugs in my policy? Do I have, um, am I having somebody that's trying to actually exploit my site and they actually maybe have found something that they're trying to, um, you know, whatever, um, trying to exploit? Uh, I, there's, a, there's a module for Happy called Blanky that, again, it's, uh, literally very, very, um, it's not built into core because it allows on, uh, it relies on a bunch of browser sniffing stuff because, uh, you know, browser vendors uh, like to use different headers and different versions and some prefix and some not prefix and it makes our lives hard. Um, even though we want this really cool security feature, it makes your life very difficult. So, but that's it. It's, it's literally like requiring it and you know, registering it and that's it. You specify your policy. I didn't specify the policy in there. Um, there's some really cool sites. Um, CSP is awesome and CSP Playground, um, which is, you can just go write a policy and learn all about anything you want. Like there, it's super great. Um, I highly recommend looking at um, Adding this to your sites, even even in just in report only mode, uh, it you like, it's it yeah. So uh, authentication, I used I used I sort of put myself into a bind when I did uh, social auth because I just sort of did Twitter and I was like yeah that's it's a, it's quite a simple pattern. Um, this is what happens when a security guy writes code too, so please don't judge. Uh, and I'll go past my hard-coded keys and, uh, oops, yeah, cookie encryption password, and there you go, uh, Wilson Phillips. Okay, uh, so it's, it's basically pretty simple. You basically, there's a, there's a plugin to do OAuth called Bell, and you can specify a strategy, and it just sort of works, and you can, it's, it's really plug-in, um, and, and so I, I, didn't, I didn't really have much to talk about uh, there, so I was like, what? what's something that doesn't get talked about a lot that uh, might be interesting to just know about or have like, sort of reminded about? And that's JSON Web Tokens. So what I did was, I was like, ooh, so we're gonna talk about um, uh, cross-site scripting here, uh, uh, cross-site cross forger here in a minute. So I was like, this plays together really well. Uh, I've got a socket connection from Reveal from the slide deck to the web server, so for these real-time updates. but as an example, I don't want, um, you know, if I have admin functions like give me all of the users that are currently connected, I don't, want, I don't want you to have access to that. I want just me to have access to that. So um, 
plus, uh, well, let me show you here. So first of all, what is Java? I kind of got all over myself here. So JSON Web Tokens. Uh, this is the this is the official definition. It's a compact URL safe means of representing claims to be transferred between two parties. The claim in a JWT are encoded as JSON. Yeah, it's a blob of JSON that's digitally signed, and somebody else wrote it, and it's been reviewed, and that means it's probably better than anything you're going to write yourself in terms of crypto. Um, that's that's just the basics of of that. Um, that's all it is. It's a blob of JSON that's signed so that uh, you can use it as, say, uh, like a, a cookie. So just as your cookie might be digitally signed, so that you it prevents tampering, I can store an admin flag in this JWT, and you can't change it because you don't know the password to re to reencode it. But I can just have that flag set, and I can rely on it. That way, I can do uh, stateless sessions and, and fun stuff like that. Um, what I did with it was, uh, so you basically call uh, this token uh, route here, which basically says, uh, take the auth credentials that I already authed with and make a JWT token out of it and, and return it back. That's literally it, how to get a token. You say, sign this blob of stuff with a password. Soup, soup, like, there's, there's a lot of more advanced stuff you can do with, with JWT. But for the most part, it's like, OK, and now I can take that. And you could pass that off to an API that I had, and I could validate it on the back end um, or any other service that I had, maybe, um, which is cool. Uh, you can also do exp expiration and things like that with it. Uh, and then I just checked that. So I'm going to jump down here into verify. JWT verify. You give it the token, the secret, and then it gives you a decoded blob, or it blows up. It's pretty cool. Uh, it's going to use uh, appropriate timing comparisons and things like that, so you don't have to worry about comparing keys and a whole bunch of other crypto stuff that's really hard, but you should know. Um, speaking of, if you want to know crypto stuff and you want to go deeper in crypto, check out CryptoPals.com uh, by a company called Matasano who put that on. Um, it leads you. It basically leads you from building basic libraries to do things like XOR to leading you down to actually breaking those ciphers. So you like you build them and you break them and you see what actually why say comparing a, a string against a, a string for like a session is bad. Like why that byte by byte comparison is bad. Things like that. Um, so that's what I did for for JWT. That's it. That's all I'm going to touch on for that. Uh, it is important for the cross-site request forgeries that we'll jump to uh, after I tangent off once again. So, cross-site request forgery. So, who's familiar with cross-site request forgery? Okay, pretty much everyone. That's uh, rad. So, um, it. The other thing, the other reason why I'm bringing up these particular things, as I didn't mention, was we see these all the time. Even though, as an example. A lot of people in this room know about them. We still see we still see this stuff pre prevalent in apps. So you might be writing good code, a coworker or a friend or something that is may not be aware, um, which is which is really good to spread your knowledge in those areas to to help the to help the people that don't know. So here's here's how uh, here's how a cross cross site request forgery attack works. Uh, it basically relies on your browser being a really useful uh, person. It's just like a browser of people now. Um, so a user logs into a site, let's say example.com, and they get a cookie back, right? It's like, hey, here's a cookie. This is who you are. It's a fortune cookie. Um, then they go to, to my evil site, evilpacket.net, and evilpacket.net says, here's some script to run. Um, really, it's just a form with an auto submission, auto submitting the form, because that's usually how you can take advantage of those things. And your browser says, you basically create this form. It says, hey, submit this form to example.com. Your browser's like, hey, cool. I know what example.com is. You've got these auth credentials. You've got these, this cookie that I need to send with to be really helpful so that it knows who you are for you know, this stateless HTTP protocol. And then it, basically, at that point, it's um, you, you, example.com honors that. And it's like, cool. You've got your credentials. You've got the payload. It validates. Great. So uh, if you want to uh, have a little fun with this, um, that link right there, if you can read it, if you go and log into um, vulnerable.liftsecurity.io slash, or just do that, you should do that. And you go to this particular link, it's actually, a JS bin. 
that is this page right here. Come on. I don't know how to use this. Okay. So it's probably. <coughs> Yeah, so it'll tweet that. I just learned about cross-site request forgery um, with my face. Um, so, yeah, also, this is my test account. So if you, like, so it's super fun. Like, if you want to see me late at night, really unhappy at a web app, this is just, that's the feed. Um, uh, anyway, so, th so all this is, uh, I know that's going to be really kind of a, so that's the image. It's literally just a form posting to vulnerable right slash tweet. Um, we actually, I could have made the iframe invisible, but it targets the iframe so that I could have made this invisible auto, auto submit. You don't see the redirected result. You'd see a blank page or whatever content I'd have. Um, the image that I included, um, and then a tweet, and then I just auto, it's down in the corner here, but document.forms.submit, just auto, auto submit, right? So, yay. Uh, so that's that's CSRF. This is this is how we take advantage of it in the wild. This is how an attacker would take advantage of it. It's it's stupidly easy. Like it's it's that's how it works. So to squish that in um, in I don't know how to use this uh, in in Happy. Are you noticing a pattern with Happy? I'm, I'm talking about Happy. I'm also talking about Happy because. I don't think we're getting exposed to Happy enough. We've heard all kinds of stuff about Express and other frameworks, or whatever. But Happy's, uh, Happy's badass, and Chris works for Walmart, and like <laughs> it's great. Um, uh, the maintainer of Crumb, which is the CSRF protection library, actually works on the Andia team, uh, Marcus. Um, but yeah, you require Crumb, and then you just re you just register it. And I had to turn on Restful True, so if we would honor the header from from the client side app. But that was. That was it. It provides you the token in a, in a cookie, and you can just, as long as you pass that cookie back, or that, that token back, in the request, uh, in the request header or the request um, <coughs> body, uh, it's something the attacker won't know, so my evil site wouldn't know about that, and I could not provide that value. Um, what we, one thing we often see with self-rolled um, CSRF libraries is that, um, Basically, uh, you like they don't validate the. There's certain there's certain edge cases where they don't validate the token. So you just you just don't put a token, or you put a, a different token, or you put a token from another valid user, and those work. Things like that. There's also some interesting edge cases. I will I will throw a little express plug in here. Uh, Luca Caratoni, um, uh, a company called Adapar, uh, found this vulnerability in Express where if you actually you include method override um, after your CSRF validation you can bypass CSRF because what happens is, is that you say, hi, I'm a get request, and uh, here's my payload. And then the, uh, the method override says, oh, hey, in the payload, you've got, you, you said you wanted to be a post. I'll change you to be a post. And you've already bypassed CSRF validation. So then you hit the post route handler, and ta-da, jazz hands. OK. Um, There we go. So, um, do testing. I am a hypocrite when it comes to testing, and I'll be honest about that. Uh, testing is, I think, hard. It's a pain to maintain. Uh, it it sucks. It, it, I don't know. It's it, it's 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 building stuff that's not my feature to make my thing go. So it's frustrating. It's it's not fun. It's a it's an uninteresting, um, not hard, but an uninteresting hard problem. So it's like, I don't want to do it. It's not fun. Uh, so let's look. Like I just want to I just want to expose people to what a simple test case with lab uh, looks like, and see just like we won't live code it because that would be a horrible idea for me. Um, but in the test, I have this. Uh, I just have this simple index file. Um, it's actually fairly. It's off the side there, but. Uh -huh. Here we go. Hang on. Yay! Okay, so um, this is pr this is pretty much it. Uh, Happy has this really cool thing called Server Inject, which uh, allows you to not have to deal with like request BS 
and using some like curl library to make requests or something like that, you can just, just with, you don't even have to start the server and bind to a port. It just puts it right through the stack. It is so nice. Um, but this test basically says reader, uh, um, that the, the app redirects when uh, you're not authenticated. Basically saying like this particular route gets validated that says, okay, you're not, uh, you, you're not off, so, so go away. Um, Server.inject, uh, server we, we have a request. Literally, it looks, it's, you got a method and a URL, and I, I, didn't, even, I didn't even give it a payload. Um, so, but it just, we, we have an assertion there, and that's, that's it. So we run this lab-e development. And throw a bunch of junk at us, it starts it, it says one test pass, test duration, um, but you can also do uh, this really cool thing dash C with lab and you get coverage. So you can shoot for a higher, higher test coverage. Now, don't let 100% test coverage fool you into thinking you've covered all your bases with your application. It's, it's certainly gonna get you there, you're gonna cover, because you're gonna, basically to get there, you're gonna deal with a bunch of a BS, which is like error conditions and things like that, which you should be handling, but you know, writing test cases for those as well and whatever. So don't let that fool you that you're basically, you're fine, right? Uh, so that's, that's, yeah, that's lab, okay. So, let's see. Oh, I remembered it, Chris. Okay. So, uh, let's see, tangent here, because this is great um, for uh, anybody doing Node. If you're doing Node, uh, this is this is basically the product of the Node Security Project right now. It is the the NSP tool, Node Security Project, um, which is really fun. You get confused with npm, but anyway, um, you install it and run it, and Thunderplanes two exploits. You can do cool stuff like you can validate your packages and your dependencies and your dependencies and dependencies against a known blacklist. And it can tell you if there's any package in your dependency tree that has a known vulnerability. That doesn't mean it's exploitable in your thing, uh, in, your, in your project, but it means that like, yeah, you might want to get it out of there. Um, interestingly enough, we, um, NSP came out a couple of months before GitHub released the Atom Editor. And they released the Atom Editor with um, uh, an old version of Marked. And so if you actually loaded any Markdown from uh, you know, say a malicious user, it could actually execute code, so which is cool. Um, it was fun, but had they actually been running this as part of their say CI process, they would have noticed that oh, this was uh, uh, this was this was something we shouldn't we shouldn't go to we shouldn't go to to prod with this right. Um, so there's that that's handy, and. Um, you're gonna do all of this great stuff. You're gonna have you're gonna have the best intentions. You're gonna care a lot. You're gonna learn about the OS top ten and all of the different vulnerabilities that are out there. And you're still gonna mess it up. And you're still gonna have some little uh, mistake in your code that's gonna lead to and maybe not a compromise, but maybe it's a bug. Maybe it's like some nasty thing in production. Uh, just like I mean, I had like I forgot those keys and they're those hard coded keys. Uh, it's something we report to clients all the time when we, when we audit apps, I should have caught it, right? Um, again, I'm human from the other side of, of finding and looking at applications and that, um, yeah, we make mistakes too. So, but that's, that's okay. Security is this. Remember I mentioned like evangelism looks like this? This is what, um, this is what security feels like too. This is the, the Penrose, uh, Penrose stairs, I guess. And you, you never get to the top. Security is literally a one step at a time thing. If you try to run up those stairs, you will fall on your face. Um, it, it is a one step at a time. When you think you're there, challenge your assumptions and take another step. That's, that's the biggest thing out of all of this that I think that you can get. Um, I think when we look back on the, the sort of topic of you should build in security as you go, right? That was the original question that I sort of like, I want to challenge to myself. I noticed that it wasn't, it wasn't really feasible. Like given the simplicity of a situation where I could just drop in, I could say security true, or I could require crumb, and it made it easy, those are the things that I built in. As soon as it started to become 
a little more architecturally hard or I was doing a task in which I was not suited to do as a developer and my, my knowledge started to, uh, my knowledge and like the iteration started, like that, that feeling of, of, of um, I, felt, I started to feel really uneasy about it. Um, what I had to remind myself is that I needed to make sure that I didn't go on to something else before I got that code to production. Right? I needed to make sure that I took care of those concerns before it got to, got to production. Um, which means that uh, I need to build the tools like NSP. Uh, you know, somebody can build a, a, a taint checker like from Chris's talk and, and put that in, in CI and uh, you know, help us build those security tools and put, put those things in place between you and production. Put those gates between you and production. It's all about process. It's all about taking that one step at a time. And so if you don't care or if you don't have the knowledge where you fall down in one of those areas, lean on a coworker to do that peer review to make sure that, that they don't just give you a plus one. A plus one in a peer review is complete crap. Don't ever take that, right? If they didn't tell you what they actually did and what they looked at, reject it. They need to do better as a reviewer. But put quality work between you and um, in production. And uh, the other thing is, is like if you're not sure where to start in terms of security, like okay, I built an app, I don't really know, like I've got some knowledge, I don't know what, I don't know what I should be doing to, to take that next step. The way you figure that out is if the thing in your app was compromised, if X happens and the business, is, and the business loses money or I lose face or I, whatever that bad thing is that you don't want to happen, that's the thing that you, guess what? That's your task list to go review, have somebody review it, like actually care about that thing. Uh, and with that, I'm done. So, any questions? I'm gonna take a selfie. Yeah. Has uh, NSP ever been on your own vulnerability blacklist? Uh, no, actually, we had a bug in NSP where NSP couldn't look at its own dependency tree because one of its dependencies actually included its dependency as a dependency, and so it kept going and it would never finish. So, it never ended up uh, there. So, uh, I'm just hang on. This is important. Okay, that was important. Okay, uh, any other questions? Any, anything about node security? Because I know I sort of just hit on a few things that I thought was important, but you might. Okay. Follow. So you did mention a whole bunch of cool, happy plugins, and that's awesome. I'm going to go look at them later, but the reality is most people use Express. So are there any that. They shouldn't. No, oh, I'm kidding. <laughs> I'm kidding. I'm kidding. Is it? Any that you do that work for Express like middleware or something? Ah, okay. So, if you wanted to, uh, which I should have gave my shameless plug because I wrote the plug in, uh, Express. If you're doing security headers, it is Happy or it's Helmet. That was, that was a, a Freudian slip there, I guess. Uh, it's called Helmet. Uh, I wrote it. I don't maintain it anymore. Um, Evan maintains it now, pretty much. Um, if you're dealing with CSRF, CSRF, don't expect to be uh, as easy to implement as Crumb. It's a giant pain in the neck. Um, auth stuff, I love Passport for dealing with auth. Um, the thing, like, that's great. Um, Passport doesn't deal with something called session fixation, though. So if you have, once you auth, you have to re-roll your, your cookie value again. Because um, I can go up to a public terminal, I can go to the page, it gives me a cookie. Then I walk away and I keep that cookie and I wait for somebody else to walk up and then auth that session. And then I have, then I have session hijack. So you have to. Reroll that cookie. Anyway, um, what else? Testing, whatever framework, just pick one and use it. Like, don't be a hypocrite like me. Um, I hate that. I hate that. I'm, I got to do better at that. Uh, consider looking at Happy, depending on what you're building. If you're building APIs, like I love the pat, pat and I'm not going to hate on Express. Um, I do think that ecosystem is a bit unstable now, considering you know one of the creators and maintainers basically dropped the mic and went to go. So, like, I do think that that ecosystem is a bit unstable. Um, that may be not the truth, but that's my opinion of it. Um, any other questions? Where do you go to learn more about this? The Node Security Project has a <laughs> bunch of stuff with this related to Node, which is a bunch of stuff. 
there's the OWASP Top 10, which is OWASP.org, which has um, a lot of resources for PHP and Java, which if you do that, cool. Uh, but it has great explanations of like the core vulnerabilities of like why this matters or what the impact is. Um, we have a problem with that. Like we don't have a lot of the a lot of the resources. Like the OWASP top ten is is you. I don't know. It's just not as it's not as developer focused as I'd like it to be. Um, we have a documentation. We have a problem um, because we've ha we have the echo chamber of the infosec community who isn't trying to be empathetic to ve developers and understand the position to build the resources that are appropriate for developers. It's getting better. Like there's, there's stuff all the time. Um, you can follow Node Security on Twitter. We try to tweet like whenever there's a new blog post or whatever that's sort of like, you know, crosses the, the sector there. Um, that's what I got. I don't, I don't know. Yes, sir. What's your opinion on like static analysis services like Veracode and places like that? Uh, I don't believe they do JavaScript. So. Uh, I don't know, and I would love for somebody to, to, to prove me wrong and, and point me at a said service. I don't know of one that is not backed by human, or that's not backed by not just humans. Because uh, that's what we do uh, at Lyft. Like, we, we, we have a service that audits your third party modules you depend on, right? However, um, it's backed by people because I don't have cool tools like what Chris is trying to build, right? Which I'm really, really hopeful uh, in that area. Uh, we have cool things like grep <laughs> and, uh, and uh, you know, some uh, you know, like ESLint. We have some ESLint rules and stuff like that that um, I've published on my uh, github.com slash evil packet, but it's super ghetto. So anyway, um, if there was one and there was a, a tool, um, I would say use it, even if it's going to provide you false positives. There's, there's, that's going to give you another automated way to keep to keep tabs on your code, right? Um, there are tools to do code smells. Um, the names escaping me right now, um, and uh, like linting and things like that. Just keeping your code clean. Again, the simplicity and complexity. Keep it clean. Keep it simple. Modularize it. Um, <coughs> makes it easy. If you were to dive into my code, you, you'd take you forever to figure out what it was. Just in this little simple, it's like 200 lines because I just left it in one file. Um, which makes it complex, which makes it difficult to understand. So, if there was a service, it'd be great. Yeah. So, uh, you were looking for feedback on, on the talk in general, and I really liked it. I, I thought the format was great. It was, it was good to hear that somebody that was really focused on security once they got into the full stack development had the same problems and frustrations that, that I do. Um, I'm wondering, have you taken this back to the InfoSec community? I'm wondering if you know. I have proposed a number of talks given that subject, and it was not well received. Let's just put it that way. So I, I've never, I've never been given the opportunity to to go back and say I've been to the land of development and I've come back bearing gifts of we should be empathetical and we, should, you know, like I haven't had that opportunity. Um, I really like this community, so I tend to like stay over here. Um, I do like we do try to keep you know going and grabbing new things and sort of trying to bring them over here. But yeah, I haven't had that opportunity. Yes, sir. So what is it about the infosec mindset that you think is the major gap between the two worlds? Uh, it's <laughs> or maybe the developer mindset. Uh, hmm. Yeah, it's to me, it's it's uh, it's just the builders versus breakers. It's um, we have to find one way in which to embarrass you. You have to protect all of them, and so we have. It's always like we focus on the hacks. We got root, boom. We got cross site scripting. All right, we got code execution, and and I I go on an immediate high. Right, I'm like sweet. I owned your shit. All right. So the developer, as soon as you communicate that, like, especially if it's communicated in like, in a way of like, yeah, I owned you hard, right? Like, which is a, which is which is a which is a way that way that it gets communicated often, right? There might be a little businessy words around it or whatever, but it gets communicated that way. The the developer. So my high goes like this. 
you're feeling and your anxiety goes a funk, right? Like you, like you hit rock bottom in terms of like, you know, like how does any site feel like when they get compromised, right? It's like, it's yeah, it's this pit in your stomach. Like, what do you do? So, it's usually delivered in a in a way that's negative, focused on the wrong thing, focused on the wrong advice and guidance. That's what I usually see. Um, and so what happens is then I, you know, especially if I'm especially if it's not in a report or something like that, and it's just a, I report a vulnerability out there. In in my high starts coming down like this, and you're you know you're still wondering what to do down here. I'm gonna be like, yeah, publish it, publish it, blog post it, you know, like like get it fixed so that I can so that I can publish it, I can brag about it, and then I get my little high back again, and then I go on to the next thing. That's the that's the typical builder versus breaker like like paradigm there, and from a feeling perspective, and it's it's what I think sort of does kind of drive uh, the two sides apart. I did give a talk on it since Chris Williams is in the back at JSConf uh, US B track last. Uh, not this last one, but the previous one. Anyway, there's a whole bunch of stuff there that I'm glossing over. <laughs> well, thank you. It was very ridiculous and very fun. Thanks you for playing along, and we're done.